We are live. It is. Oh yes. Okay. So now what I want to do is so so what we're going to do today is talk about the uh, the overview of the solar system. This is going to lead up to an activity we're going to do next Tuesday where we're going to build our own planets in the computer. And by build our own planets, I mean we're going to try and figure out how you construct a planet that could hold on to a surface temperature where you could get liquid water at the surface. So that's what I want you to focus on today. How would you even do that calculation? Very carefully. <laughs> well, so you'll, you'll find out, right? You'll find out how easy or hard this is to do. And just to point this out, um, my friend Ravi uh, just finished writing a paper about this. So if you think that this is not what people do. This is what people do. Now the model we're going to do is something we can do in a day. He added in a lot more complexity and did it much more carefully, but he found out that the Earth is right at the very inner edge of what we call the continuously habitable zone. This is uh, new, calculation, new calculations, much, much, much uh, closer than it used to be. It's 0.996 astronomical units is the inner edge of the habitable zone. We're at one. And, no, we're not, but we have a, our eccentric orbit is only 1%. So we're always in the habitable zone. But here's the thing that's kind of scary. And I just want to throw this out there because the original calculation of the habitable zone was done similar to what we're going to do by Jim Cast in 1993. You've met Jim. And he at that time told everybody that it was not possible for the Earth to enter a runaway greenhouse phase because there simply wasn't enough carbon and we weren't close enough to the habitable zone edge to push us into runaway greenhouse like Venus. Ravi's work suggests that that may not be true. And that is, at the same time, scares the hell out of me because if that, I don't know what that means. Are, are, is global climate change going to push us into um, runaway greenhouse? At the same time, if Earth was going to go runaway greenhouse, I want to be here to watch it because that's going to be something. I've always wondered how that happened on Venus. So we could just watch that happen. That would be awful. Oceans will boil away. We'll be living. I don't know what's going to happen. Anyway, it's, it's pretty interesting stuff. And so Ravi's starting to work on that question now. of Because uh, it's always been sort of this thing like, well, we, we can't dump enough CO2 in the atmosphere to make a difference on Earth. Uh, turns out maybe we can. Yeah. And how close is Mars to the outer? Ah, that, so that's a totally other question, right? And that requires a different set of physics and a different set of models. And Ra Ravi's been working on that too. But the thing that limits the inner edge is just the, the greenhouse effect, right? The greenhouse gas gets so hot, you get so much extra warming for whatever's in your atmosphere that you boil the oceans away. And it's a feedback loop because you don't have to get the water boiling, you just have to get it high enough so it's evaporating more than it's precipitating. And then you get more water vapor, which is a bigger greenhouse effect, and boom, 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 boom. And next thing you know, your, your oceans are gone and they're in the atmosphere and plate tectonics shuts off and all the volcanoes put all the CO2 in the atmosphere and you wind up like Venus. How quickly would that happen? I, mean, I don't know. We observe it. I don't know. I don't know. It's, a, it's an open question. We don't know how long it happened. Um, the things I've seen are not, ter you know, like 100,000 years, but quickly. Yeah. With their, without water, so the plates need some lubricant to get them to slide. So if you remove all the water and you dehydrate the rock, it, it gets stickier. And so you and and then here's the really interesting thing: you still have to get all that heat out because the re, the way we get heat out of the Earth is by uh, by sliding the plates around. That generates a lot of heat and that dissipates heat out of the out of the mantle. But if that stopped, that heat has to go someplace. And what happens is the crust gets thicker and thicker and thicker, and then all of a sudden the whole surface pretty much just goes and that's what happened on Venus. We'll see some pictures when we talk about Venus. So, isn't that exciting just to make your day happy? Uh, it's, so so the, the, what I just described is observations from radar. You, we look at the surface of Venus. There are no new craters. 700 million years ago the whole surface just turned over. So that's an observation. Um, now, the, here's the interesting thing. We don't know what Venus was like before that happened. Uh, there are two schools of thought. One is pretty much since four and a half billion years ago, Venus has been turning itself over every 750 million years or so. There are some folks who suggest that Venus might have been not so bad 750 million years ago, and then suddenly it went So 
Anyway, we have no way to find out. Question. Yeah. Um, so yesterday in nuclear physics, Dr. Gary was talking about neutrino plugs from the sun. Yep. And he was saying that we'll talk about that from here. Uh, yes, we will talk about that when we get to, well, oh, no, I kind of skipped that part of the sun, didn't I? Do you want to talk about that? Cool. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, well, no, I, I take that back. We are going to talk about it more when we talk about nuclear fusion and stars. We didn't really process that. But the neutrinos, so let's hold off on that. But the neutrinos are a process, um, when you fuse hydrogen into helium, it's a four-step process that winds up with gamma rays and neutrinos coming out. And so the neutrinos don't interact with matter, and they come out almost instantaneously. And it's how we know that that's the process that's happening in the sun to produce energy because we can predict how many neutrinos. So we'll talk about that when we talk about uh, stellar uh, fusion sources. Yeah. Uh, well, hang on to that question. Yeah, it's there. Ninety-six percent of the universe doesn't interact yeah, with I know, matter. It's yeah, strange I know it is. It is. Uh, well, so think about it this way: it's not so strange if you consider not everything reacts with a magnetic field. That's true. So, so, so you might, you know, there are other examples of of that. Yeah. Okay, so before we get to that, uh, and, and this is leading into what we're going to go through for, since we have so much time to talk about planets, I'm excited about that. We get to talk about all these interesting things like uh, the fact that we're about to destroy ourselves through global climate change. <coughs> you, all right. Uh, at least we're going to be here to see it. That's the important part. All right, but for this discussion, though, I wanted to talk about how we get the solar system and what uh, the solar system says to us about how the solar system must have formed. Because we can look at this picture here and start to make some uh, educated guesses as about what physical processes were involved in the formation of the solar system. And then once we have an idea of what those physical processes are, we can start to see what the original state was that resulted in the solar system. So these are the observations. And uh, I have some slides here uh, that I've brought in from my other astronomy class, but I think they'll serve the purpose. Um, so first, well, first of all, let me write down one thing. The most important part is 99.8% of stuff in our solar system is the sun, right? Okay, so, and the, most of the rest is Jupiter, right? If we talk about the rest of it, 0.2%, that's right, most of it is Jupiter. And then there's the rest of the debris in the solar system. Like us. Like us, yeah, or all the planets we live on. So, so it's really a discussion of solar systems is a discussion of star formation, and we are the byproduct of star formation. Now, we got to talk about efficiency, Right? If you, were, if you were in a manufacturing process and you were trying to build a human and you put in 100% of your input materials to get a human out, right? you got you to build a star system to do that. So you do that and 99.8% of, of your stuff is waste, goes into the sun, <laughs> the rest into most of the other planets when you finally get down to people. So we're not very efficient being here, right? But on the other hand, we couldn't do anything without that 99.8 percent of the sun. Have you seen the scroll over from most recent XKCD? No. Maybe it's one before that. It says that a human is a, a a method of converting really old stardust and stardust very far in the future through a roundabout process that involves checking email a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree with that. You know, yeah, I have a, a colleague of mine who invented a concept called the nuosphere, right? So you've got the you've got the lithosphere, the atmosphere, right? The biosphere, which is life. The nuosphere is life that can know about the universe. Yeah. So the nuosphere is life that can observe the universe. So humans, dolphins, and two mice. Yes, <laughs> humans, dolphins, and two mice. Okay. So here are the here is the uh, solar system as we see it now. There are eight major planets. Nine, if you include Pluto, and uh, the uh, this is was for a long time considered to be the canonical solar system. This is what all solar systems look like. Later on, we're going to find out that our solar system actually doesn't look an whole awful lot like other solar systems. Um, new Kepler results just came out that these things called uh, super Earths are at least as common as Neptune's. We have no super Earths in our solar system. So our solar system is missing some stuff. Our solar system is this nice, relatively f uh, circularized orbits. Many other solar systems do not have circular <laughs> orbits. They've got elliptical orbits. Uh, so, so we use, for the, you know, for the last 100 years, this is 
what a solar system looks like, but we'll find out later this is other solar systems have some different properties. Yep. Yeah. Ten Earth masses. So it's a between an Earth and a, and a Neptune. Neptune's about 15 Earth masses. Earth is about one. So it's... it's yeah. So, so a super Earth would be a planet that is like the Earth but bigger. Right? And... Yeah. And we don't know. Because we don't know what... When does a super Earth become a Neptune? We don't know. And is it a solid chunk of rock or a gas? We don't know. Yeah, so, so this is the study. So geophysicists are trying to work out what happens as you make Earth bigger. And the only reason they know what happens as you make a planet bigger is because we have things to study. Earth, Neptune, Jupiter. Those are our benchmarks. But there's, we don't have the, the one between Earth and Neptune, so we don't see the transition. But these transitional planets that are halfway between Neptune and Earth are more common than we thought. We don't have any in our solar system. Okay. Uh, all right. So, what sort of things do we need to explain about the solar system? I'm going to write these things down, uh, and then you can tell me uh, what's going on here. So, the remaining two percent. Here are the observations. It's flat. Uh, the planets revolve counterclockwise. They rotate counterclockwise, mostly. Some notable exceptions. Venus and, not Neptune, Uranus. Uranus. Right. Venus is really flipped on its side or rotates the opposite direction, depending on how you want to look at it. I like to think that it's flipped on its side because that makes more sense to me, that it was rotating the same direction as all the others and then got hit by something. Right. Uranus is flipped on its side. Which is weird because that, that one blows me away. Because if you think about it, most of the m massive giant planets are, don't have much tilt to their axis. Which makes sense because they're so big it would be really hard to... So what in the heck happened to Uranus to get it smacked in the Uranus? <laughs> Sorry, the 12-year-old boy in me got out, I apologize. All right. What else? Ah, objects all have similar ages. Now, how do we know that? What's our, what's our reasoning behind that? Well, so we don't know that yet. We're trying to build our model. That would explain them all as having similar ages, but we then go out and measure the ages. But how do we know? Uh, so what, which things have we measured the ages of? The moon and the we haven't measured the sun. No. Moon, moon Earth, moon. Mars, Mars, meteorites. Comets. Everything we've measured, the very oldest sample we find is about 4.5 billion years old. And in fact, if you look at the moon in particular, we have a slew of samples, and there's a you know there's a range of ages from four and a half billion to two billion or whatever. But the oldest rock you can find is 4.5 billion years old. So if the Earth and the Moon and Mars and the comets and the asteroids all formed four and a half billion years ago, we can't find any other rock. The chances we make the inference that everything must have formed four and a half billion years ago. But we don't have any direct measurement for Jupiter uh, and all that kind of stuff. There's also three categories of stuff. There are terrestrial worlds. There are Jovian worlds, which are the gas giants. And there are debris. Those are the three categories of stuff in the solar system. So whatever we have, uh, that's to uh, that we need to explain. We need to explain the fact that we have rocky planets, gas planets, and stuff. Leftover. That's that's in the yeah that's in debris. So I didn't even know this. Did you know that Jupiter, Pluto has five moons? How did you know that and not tell me? I I, I didn't know. Yeah. Pluto. As soon as they demoted it from a planet, I stopped paying attention because I didn't care anymore. Yeah, right. But but so you've got Pluto and Charon, which is what I thought. And then I had heard about one other one. But then the fact that it has all these other moons. Oh. Anyway, so that just goes into debris. And so whatever system we have, uh, or any whatever theory we have, has to explain all this stuff. That we're flat, we revolve in the same direction, rotate in the same direction, mostly. Um, and I'll give you a hint that this mostly part connects back to debris. Right? That's a key thing. That after all is said and done, you're smacking things into each other. So that causes, so for example, the moon. Why do we have this huge moon around the Earth? 
No other terrestrial planet in our solar system has a big moon. Except for Pluto, <laughs> right? Yeah, except for Pluto. So, uh, but but our, we're really a double planetary system. Think about this. If the moon was just a little bit larger, like maybe twice the size or maybe three times its size, it would be another Earth with the same atmosphere, same conditions on the surface. Well, I wonder, why is everybody talking about terraforming Mars instead of terraforming the Earth? Or the moon. We're terraforming the Earth right now. We're doing that. But seriously, why can't we terraform the, the, the moon? The moon. Why can't we terraform the moon? I concur. Yeah. I, I think we could just stick with turning it into... Did you see the whole, the whole thing that happened with the petition to create a Death Star? Yes, I did see that. Yes. Yeah, that was good. All right, so let me just make sure I've got a couple things in slides here. Um, our large bodies orbit in the same direction. They mostly rotate in the same direction. Um, we've got the two planet types. We've got the smaller swarms. Notable exceptions. Okay. So that's what we've got to explain. We've got to explain all this stuff. So how do we go about doing that? We've got to go outside and make some observations. Um, the first thing you want to know is, well, what are the properties of these objects that are flying around the solar system? And there are pretty much three things you can measure. You can measure mass of a planet. And the mass of a planet is just, uh, well, how do you measure the mass of a planet? Uh, density, radius. I don't know the density. I, I, Make a scale. I could estimate the density, but the planetary densities between, between Jupiter, Saturn, and, and Mercury range from 1,000 to 9,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So what do I use for my estimate? Pick one. Pick one. All right, so let's pick Saturn. Did you know Saturn is less dense than water? Yes. Do you know how you can tell? If you put it in a bathtub, it leaves rings. <laughs> it floats. That's a joke. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> No, it's so, so my, you can't estimate the density because that's a huge range. You're going to be off by a factor of 10, right? No, a factor of 2. You could, you could figure out the composition of the surface, but the Earth's surface is only 2 grams per cubic centimeter, whereas the core is 9. Well, we can estimate the density not just by measuring the surface, but by also measuring the material of the planet's face, which we assume is the same particular components of the planet Earth. Mm, there's a better way. There's a better way. Yeah, go with orbits. Yeah, how do we measure the mass of the sun? Measure, yeah, we use Kepler's version, Newton's version of Kepler's law. So the mass is something you can measure by orbits. Now this is limited to planets that have things orbiting it. So this is Newton's version of Kepler's law. We measure the period, right? Measure the semi-major axis. We know what g is. Do you smell something burning? Yeah, small knowledge. Yeah, I'm sure it's fine. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's, it's probably me. Uh, anyway, so you can measure the mass. If you can measure the period, the semi-major axis. So the mass of the sun, if you put in one astronomical unit, you put in one year in appropriate units, um, chunk that through, you get the mass. You can do that with the Earth, right? You'll want to remember that we made an approximation here. This has to be mass of planet plus mass of the object so if we wanted to do this for the Earth and Moon, we'd have to do this. So we could find out the mass of the Moon if we already knew the mass of the planet. And we can figure out the mass of the planet because we're here. We just orbit stuff around it. You guys do this in physics lab, you know, where you drop stuff in 2210. Drop stuff, measure g, little g, measure little g, gives you big M. We know the mass of us, so we can figure out the mass of the moon by how much it goes around it. That only works because the moon's so big, and you have to take into account both of them. Uh, if we wanted to figure out the mass of uh, Venus, how would we do that? we'd have to send our own satellite because there are no moons around Venus. So you have to basically go throw something onto Venus. And we've done that. Mars has a little moon, so we know what Mars' mass is. Jupiter's mass we've got from the moon Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. Pluto's a little trickier. We can get the combined mass of both of them, but we won't know until the flyby goes by and we get a little tug from the, from the planet what its mass really is. So we don't really have a good estimate for the mass of Pluto. I mean, we have a to within a factor of three or something like that. 
All right, so that's how you get the mass. Uh, but once you have the mass, you can get the size. Because just by looking at it, we're in the solar system, so we get the size. So the next thing you want to measure is the radius. That's pretty easy to do. You just measure it in the, our solar system. You measure it, and then that lets you get the density because density is mass divided by volume. And this is the thing that everyone cares about in planetary physics, the density of the material. And that's why I was saying you can't really estimate it right, because that's the thing you're trying to get at. Like, what is stuff made out of? If you can measure the mass and you can measure the size, then you get something physical, which is the density. And some of the densities of things, just to write this down, the density of Saturn. Saturn is 700 kilograms per cubic meter. Um, the density of Mars is about 3,300 in those same units. The density of Earth is about uh, 5,200, something like that. The density of Mercury is about uh, 5,600. And then you have to worry about, to figure out what the material is actually made out of, you have to think about the compressed versus uncompressed density. Because these planets are gravitational, the material is going to get compressed. So to really get at it, you have to figure out uh, what the uncompressed density is so you take gravity into account. And for comparison, some of these things that are interesting, water is 1,000, that's H2O. Uh, rock is 2,500 to 3,000, depending on this. So this is silicon oxide, rock, just stuff you get out. So the crust of the Earth. Iron is 8,000. So once you've got these densities, you can start to make some predictions about what this stuff is made out of. Uh, what's the Earth made out of? Iron and carbon. Iron and rock, yeah. right? Iron and rock. And you're just doing that because you're just saying, well, I need a weighted density of 5,200. 5, I put in enough 8,000 and enough 2,500 to get 5,200. So you can start to make some rough approximations of the proportion of different types of material that are in these things. Now, what is Saturn made out of? Water. <laughs> right. It does break down a little bit because Jupiter's density is a little bit over one. Is it water? No. It's hydrogen and helium. Its density is controlled by its gravity. And so you'd have to take spectroscopic measurements to know that it's mostly hydrogen and helium and then work out some equations of state to figure out what the density would be given its mass. Um, well, that's the nice thing about Jupiter, though, is because it's mostly gas, you can tell from the shape of the spectral lines a temperature profile as a function of depth, and you can get an idea of how deep the atmosphere is, because you are getting photons from lots of different depths. And then plus, you can just do some, uh, some back-of-the-envelope calculations to demonstrate for yourself that if you were to make Jupiter, because you know what Jupiter's density is, if you were to make Jupiter out of water, it would be a lot uh, smaller. Like, well, it would, it would have so much gravity it would contract, is the point. Like, you, you can do some things where you say, oh, if I, if I make this out of water, it's too big. Like, you, the equation of state of water just won't support what you see. So you make some, some inferences. And it gets a little bit more complicated than that. You put in, um, you know, functions of pressure and temperature as a function of depth, and you do a lot of computer models, and you wind up with a model for the interior of the planets. Uh, okay, so, but the debris though, this is really fun because some of the debris we have, right, in the form of meteorites, and some of those meteorites are made of iron, almost exclusively. Some are made of rock, some are made of ice. Some are a mixture of all those things. And so you can start to, uh, you can start to connect what things are made of to their spectroscopic signatures. So if I see an asteroid, an iron asteroid has this very specific spectral signature. So I can do, take its spectra and infer its density. Because I have a sample on the Earth that I've measured in the laboratory and I know its density. So you can do some remote sensing that way. All right. So questions about, uh, about the type of stuff that are out there? So the name of the game in planetary science is density, which is exciting because this is, you are all living in the first, uh, first decade where we have planets outside of our solar system where we know their densities. This goes back to uh, Mike's, Mike Hess's question. 
how do you know what a super Earth is, right? You measure its mass, you measure its size, you get its density. Is it made of rock? Is it made of gas? Is it made of iron? Right? And this is what, why we're so excited about these things because super Earths, if it turns out they're made of rock, that's exciting because we can live on a rock and a super Earth would have a lot more real estate. Can't have more gravity, Not necessarily. So let's think about that. So, so gravity is... Um, Gravity, uh, if I set mg, which is the force due to gravity on Earth, equal to the force due to gravity between two objects, right? This is little g is equal to gm over r squared. So let's say for the sake of argument, well, let's not say for the sake of argument. Let's, let's put in the density, right? So the density of the planet is uh, equal to mass divided by r cubed to order of magnitude. Right, isn't that what density is? So let's put that in for the mass. That means that the density of the mass is equal to density times r cubed. So this is g times the density times r cubed over r squared. That's going to go away. Did I do that right? Yeah. So then this is g rho r. So for a same density material, a bigger planet has stronger gravity. But as you make the planet bigger, the density is going to increase. Or, yeah, the density is going to increase. Is that right? Which would make it a little bit weight, which would make R smaller. So it's not as simple <laughs> as you might think because these two things are conflated. Right? You can't put, I mean, I could put R back in terms of mass and density, but then I get back what I had before. So, the, so if you assume a constant density, you can't assume that you know what's going on with the radius. And if you assume a constant radius, you can't assume what's going on with the density. So this is why it's tricky. We don't know where the, where the cutoff is between an Earth and a super-Earth and a gas giant. Because if you start to make the Earth bigger, you're going to get a denser planet, right? So it's not quite clear. Right now, the rule of thumb is Anything less than 10 Earth masses is probably a rock, <laughs> right? <laughs> but think about that for a second. So let's, let's assume you can get 10 Earth masses without changing the density too much, right? So 10 Earth masses, uh, let's see, how are we going to do that? So 10 Earth masses without changing the density. Let's, let's put this back in. How can we do that? D rho r, 10 Earth masses. Oh, I know what I want to do. Do I want to put in, I want to get rid of the radius. Yeah, let's get rid of the radius. That's not as easy to do, is it? Well, let's do this. Let's, let's take this guy and put r over r. So this is now r cubed. So that means this guy is r cubed is equal to mass over density. So I plug in r cubed down here, and that gives me g m r over, oh, well, that gives you the same thing. Durr. Okay. <laughs> anyway, it's not easy, is what I'm trying to say. And you have to take into account both this stuff. But if you did the, the kind of brain dead thing, which is the first thing I thought about doing, where you would keep the size of the planet the same, and you just increase the mass, then that would tell you that the gravity is 10 times more. Right? But that's going to compress this thing. And if, let's say, it compresses it by a factor of 2, that's 2 squared. That's 10 divided by 4, so it's really only 5 times more. But there are plenty of creatures on this planet that weigh more than 10 times what I do. My horse, for example. Or a whale. Or a whale. Right? It, it's in the water, so it doesn't count. Oh. But if you think about, yeah, no, OK, an elephant. So clearly, surface gravity is not the limiting factor to life. Right? And in fact, and this is the exciting thing, it's entirely possible that this planet that we're on is the least habitable planet you could have. Well, think about it. Super-Earths would have more water. Super-Earths would have more real estate. Super-Earths would have more volatiles. Super-Earths would have more of everything. And as we all know, more is better. So it might be more habitable than the Earth. And yeah. microbial life is not. Have they made an impression of like higher gravity and higher pressure are actually the Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because what, you, what it does is it concentrates. Well, if you think about it, uh, most material differentiates 
right? And what do microorganisms do but exploit chemical gradients? And if you can get a stronger chemical gradient because you have a stronger gravitational field, or you could even, oh, this is crazy. There are organisms on the planet that have, uh, they're called magnetotactic bacteria. They use magnets inside of them to orient themselves. You could imagine organisms that, have, that are gravotactic, Right? You've got such a strong gravitational field that not only do they utilize it, I, mean, I guess we're gravotactic, aren't we? We orient, <laughs> but they could use it as a source of energy, possibly. Yeah? I just read the other day that there's a proof now that salmon memorize the magnetic field intensity of islands from yeah. which they were born and they use that to get back to That's fascinating. Well. Okay. Yeah. That's fascinating. Memorize magnetic field intensity. Well, I, so what I always blows me away is how. Well, I guess it doesn't blow me away. They, they do these things, you know, the dog that gets lost in vacation in Washington, the person goes back to Kansas, and then six years later, the dog shows up in Kansas. That's not remarkable. The remarkable thing is it took the dog six years, and it was just messing around that whole time. It knew, I mean, it drove in the car. It knew exactly where. If I took you in the car to Washington, could you find your way back to Utah? Yeah, you could. You, no, no, you wouldn't. You, you'd figure it out. You might have to go a couple wrong ways. There you go. I think you'd probably do all right. But it's funny that when, when we think of an animal doing it, we're like, oh, you know, that's really amazing. It's like, no, the amazing thing is it took that dog six whole years to get back. It, it was up visiting people in Tennessee and then went up to D.C. for a while and down in Mexico and Baja and before it got back to Kansas. I know. Yeah. All right, I'm going to write this back down, not to bring us back onto topic or anything. Um, so mass and radius gives you density, so those are the important things. So what else can we tell about the planets that might be useful? Okay, yeah, but that's, we use that to get the mass. But it's orbit, so yeah, so let's say that the orbit... Ah, yeah, okay, so that's, there we go. So the orbit gives us all this stuff, but the other thing you might want to know is the distance from the sun. But why would you care? You could calculate a temperature, right? So temperature, the distance from the sun, all this stuff, and the distance from the sun, temperature is important too. This stuff we care about related to this because one thing, temperature is going to depend on where you are from the sun. It's also going to depend on your, de your, your mass, your density, and your radius because that's going to tell you what type of atmosphere you have and your atmosphere affects what's happening on the surface temperature. We're going to talk about just the distance from the sun though first. And if you know the density of the temperature, what the chemical composition Yes, yeah, absolutely. Right, you can do an equation of state, PT. Yeah? I was just wondering how the mass radius and density gives the atmosphere. Ah, great question. So the mass tells you how much stuff you have, right? The radius tells you what type of planet you have. And the density, well, it's really the, the mass and the radius tells you what type of planet you have. So what these things tell you is uh, Jupiter is a gas giant. So that tells us something about what that atmosphere must be made out of. It's got to be hydrogen and helium. Uh, in the case of Earth, right, if, uh, if you look at Earth and Mars, the fact that Earth is more massive, and we're going to do a little activity on this in a second, the fact, the fact that Earth is more massive means it can hold on to more of its atmosphere. And if you know its density, you know what the Earth is made out of. And if you know what it's made out of, you can make a guess at what its atmosphere is. Isn't right? the atmosphere dependent on what was in like the um, molecular cloud that you started forming. No, that's, yeah, so no, and that's, well, we're going to get to temperature in a second, but no, what, what the atmosphere, what matters is what gases can condense out of the cloud. So, for example, close to the, stu to the sun, you're too hot to condense methane. So you don't expect a lot of methane to be in the rocks that you form as planets. You can deliver methane in ice, water, and things like that through comets later. Right? But the, the composition is going to give you sort of the atmosphere. So the temperature is important. All these things are important. Surface temperature depends on the atmosphere. We're going to leave the atmosphere aside for right now. We'll get back to that in just a few minutes. But uh, I, what I want to do is walk through how you calculate the temperature of an object depending on its location. Because this is really the thing that controls... Well, it controls a lot of stuff. Um, it controls condensation sequence, it controls surface temperature, uh, that sort of stuff. So, first thing I want to do is write down the input. We're going to do what's called an energy balance model. 
An energy balance model, all that means is all the energy coming in has to equal all the energy going out. And that's just conservation of energy. If the sun shines on something, that something must re-radiate as much energy as it absorbed. Because there's no way, I mean, how are you going to store it otherwise? Now in the Earth, you can, the Earth sunlight hits it, it stores energy in the form of wind and clouds, but eventually that goes to heating the atmosphere, which heats the surface, which gets re-radiated away. And you can write down your energy budget, like this much energy in, and then it gets deposited in clouds, gets deposited on the surface, gets deposited in wind. You can write all that stuff down, but in the end, the stuff hitting the top must equal the stuff coming out. That's energy balance. So we need an equation that has energy in, and then we can set that equal to energy out. That means you just have an extra term on energy out, right? Now, right? So, so this, but this is the thing, right? So we're assuming that the planet we're in question is not a net generator of energy. So this is a rock that has no net energy. Now for Earth-like planets, that's fine because radioactive um, heat coming out of it is very small. For Jupiter and Saturn, that's not a good approximation because the gravitational contraction has heated them up so much and they're still contracting that they radiate energy. So they are not in energy balance. They are letting out more energy than they put in. And so you would have to put out, you'd have a, this balance wouldn't hold. Right? Well, what, no, what you do is you would just consider, I mean, energy balance still has to hold. You're not generating energy out of anything. But you would have to say that you'd have to account for all of it. To calculate Jupiter's temperature, if that even means anything, you have to take into account the fact that it's getting energy from the sun plus its. So really, that's an energy in term because it's got radioactive. But we're ignoring that for the time being for uh, Earth like planets. Now we're gonna we're gonna make one other assumption. We're gonna assume these things are fast rotators. Why do we make that assumption? Let me give you an example. Um, you're 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 making a chicken on a rotisserie grill. Oh, even temperature even temperature distribution in and out, right? Because if I take that chicken and I don't turn it, I'm gonna scorch one side and the other side will be raw. There's no energy balance there. <laughs> yes, yeah. Well, we're going to talk about those in just a second. That's a slow rotator. Yeah. But so if you rotate the planet fast enough, then you can model the chicken as a perfect energy balance because all the energy coming in gets radiated out and it's evenly distributed. Now, for most planets, that's pretty good, right? So that works for the Earth. does not work for Venus. It does work for Mars. It doesn't work for Mercury. So I guess we're only batting 500. Nobody's perfect. That's, that's all right. So let's start with the energy inside. So what do we want the units to be? We want the units on this to be, and I guess I should say, hmm, when I say energy, I, what I really mean is power. But since we're going to do this, since everything's happening in the same unit time, the seconds cancel out and you get just energy. But if I want to write down the power, I want to write down the power energy in. What is that going to be due to? The intensity of the sun. We have that, a name for that. It's called the, the intensity is called the flux, which is the luminosity of the sun divided by the area of the sphere where you are in the orbit. Right? So this is how far away you are from the sun. You take the total luminosity of the sun, divide it by the area of the sphere over which that energy is distributed. So from the case of the Earth, this R would be one astronomical unit. Right? And as you go away, it drops off like 1 over R squared. But the energy, and this is, this is a flux. This is energy per square meter, or power per square meter. But we have to distribute it over a planet. The planet is intersecting the starlight in the cross-sectional area. So we approximate that with pi r p squared. So we multiply this by pi r p. That's the radius of the planet. So if we just uh, let me draw a picture up here. So here's our planet, which has a radius r p. Here's the sun over here. It has a distance r. And planet is exposing space. So the cross-sectional area is like a we just approximate it as a as a circle, pi r squared. So now this has the units of power. We've got power divided by area times area. Okay? But it's not quite that because the planet reflects some light. Right? It reflects um, 
well, let's see, in the case of the Earth, clouds reflect, ice reflects, water reflects, land reflects. And uh, we have a name for that. It's called the albedo. And the albedo, I'll write it over here, A is defined as the fraction of light reflected. Okay, so a albedo of zero is a is a uh, is perfect is like coal, right? Like it's just black. It's absorbing everything. No, no, wait. Fraction of light reflected. Yes, an albedo of zero means it's black, right? An albedo of one would be error. So if it's one. That means you're absorbing no energy, you're reflecting it all. If it's zero, it means you're absorbing it all. And so we write this down as one minus A. So if A is one, there's no energy input. If A is zero, all of the energy gets in. Okay? A is a property of the surface, depends on what it's made out of. Ice, basalt, clouds, whatever. All right. Yes, it does. But you can measure, so there's, A is different throughout the planet. The poles have an A that's 0.9. The ocean has something that's 0.2 or 0.05 in some cases. But you take a globally averaged. And for the Earth, that's between 0.3 and 0.4. Okay. Now, if you were going to get really serious about it and do a latitude and longitude model, you'd have to take into that account, the different albedos. So this is the energy in. The energy out is just going to be due to the, um, the planet's just black body radiation. Okay? So the black body radiation, you remember, is uh, sigma t to the fourth. That's the temperature of the planet. Uh, except that's a flux. That's per square meter. So I have to multiply that by the area. What area am I going to use? Remember, this is a rapidly rotating. Think of your chicken. Only half of the chicken is getting heated, but what part of the chicken is radiating? All of it. So I need the area of the sphere, which is just 4 pi rp squared. So I've got the energy in on this side, energy out over here. Now I can solve for the temperature, right? Because I know all these other things. Look at what doesn't matter. The radius of the planet is irrelevant. Pi rp squared goes away. It doesn't matter how big your planet is. And the reason is, is because the area that's absorbing it and the area that is uh, emitting it both goes like r squared. So if you make the planet bigger, you absorb more radiation, but you also emit more. So it cancels out. So that means that the surface temperature, Tp, is just equal to the quarter root, or the fourth root, I guess, of L divided by 16 pi r squared, yes, because I got two fours in there, times 1 minus a to the 1 half, or to the 1 quarter. Okay. And then your book puts that in terms of uh, of stellar temperature. I like to leave it in terms of stellar luminosity because the luminosity is something that can easily be calculated. And you guys remember this from what we talked about before and on your exam. The stellar luminosity, L sub sun, is just uh, sigma t to the fourth times uh, 4 pi r of the sun. And that's the temperature of the sun. So if you know the temperature and the radius of the sun, and I, and I put that in there because even with the equation given in your book, you need to know the radius and temperature of the star. So I just leave it in there in terms of the luminosity. But you could go ahead and put the luminosity in and then factor that all up. But I like to do it this way. And since this is our class, my class, the class, okay, we're going to do it our way. All right, so now we can do some calculations. And I'm going to write down for rapidly rotating planets, for rapid rotators using this. And I'm just going to plug in a bunch of numbers um, and put this in terms of things we don't necessarily know. The temperature of the planet is equal to 279 times 1 minus a to the 1 fourth 
times R over 1 AU to the one, minus 1 half Kelvin. So if you know R in terms of astronaut, this is for the sun, right? If you're, if you're doing a different star, you've got to use this. This is for the sun. That if you know the albedo of the planet and how far away it is, 279 multiply it times that. So we do the Earth. And the Earth's temperature for an albedo of 0.3 is about T Earth, 255 Kelvin. 255 Kelvin for the Earth. Does that make sense? 255 Kelvin? What is room temperature in Kelvin? Say it again. 300 Kelvin. So you're here to tell me that the surface of the Earth is very cold. In fact, the average surface temperature of the Earth never gets above freezing. I don't buy that at all. We have clouds. <laughs> we have other things going on, right? This is called the um, the uh, well. It's not your. The black body temperature would be without the albedo. This is, uh, let's call it the bare rock temperature. The bare rock temperature is 255 Kelvin for the Earth. But if you measure the Earth's average surface temperature, which is 289, I can do that now. Used to be 288. It's now 289. Woo! Good job, everybody. We rule. We just raised the global temperature by one degree. 289, actually that's not true because it's centigrade, 288.6. And rising, okay? But what's the difference there is 33 degrees. Where does that come from? Here yeah. So the sigma, can you write me what that is? It's the Stefan Boltzmann constant. It's 5.67 times oh, 10 to the minus eight. Literally. It's just a constant, yeah. It comes from our black body radiation stuff. So here's the thing I want to point out, though, right? Uh, the Earth has a 33 degree Kelvin premium in its temperature that's entirely due to CO2, water vapor, and methane in our atmosphere. Those are the primary greenhouse gases ranked in order one, two, three in the most in their contribution to the current greenhouse gases. Um, that gives us 33 degrees. Now think about this for a second. The ratio, so the water vapor in the atmosphere is like 1%, 2%, depending on where you are. CO2 is, uh, uh, what's the current value? It keeps going up, so I don't know. It's like 400 parts per million. I think it's 385 or something right now. Parts per million. And methane is uh, parts per billion. I don't remember the number, 10, let's say. So these very, very, very minute constituents in the atmosphere cause a 33 degree increase in the temperature of our planet. And that's good, because if that wasn't the case, we wouldn't be here, we'd have an ice ball. But this is the reason why global climate change scares me to death, because it's not very hard to double that number. In fact, we're well on our way to doing it by 2025 or something like that. And the, green, <laughs> the greenhouse effect is molecule by molecule. If you double the number of molecules, you double the impact. Now here's the thing, CO2 is not the dominant greenhouse factor, it's water vapor, right? A greenhouse factor is water vapor. Getting 1% increase in water vapor to go to 2% is hard, er. But here's the deal, this goes up by two, raises this by five, this goes up by two. What if we double that? Instead of 30, Everybody. yeah, <laughs> yeah, right? And then, here's, and then here's the really scary thing. You ready for this? Yeah. The permafrost is melting now. And guess what's locked in the permafrost? Carbon. Well, albedo too, so, well, so we're absorbing more. But then the carbon combines with oxygen and starts dumping CO2 out even higher. So this is why I get nervous about global climate change. And then I'm even more nervous after Ravi's paper because this is 33 degrees. Right now they're saying we're on track to increase this number by plus uh, about 4 degrees Kelvin by 2100. 
Good attitude. I can have that attitude. I don't have children. It's not my damn planet, monkey boy. Yeah, have at it. So, <laughs> right? I've opted out, humans. I'm no longer part of this species. No. But seriously, though, so four degrees by 2100. That already, they're, you know, uh, predicting all sorts of uh, things like huge storm surges in New York every summer and Bangladesh is basically goes underwater and you know I mean not good stuff at four degrees. The fact that our dominant climate gases causes 33 degrees and if and remember the feedback I told you on Venus you raise this this goes up water vapor goes up now that's not going to happen in 50 or 100 years that might take 10,000 Right? And then there's also, I mean, who knows what's going to happen. Maybe you get so much water vapor in the atmosphere, you get more clouds, reflects more, and it might provide this. And to our best estimates, we're not looking at doubling this number. We're looking at sticking at around uh, 4 degrees Kelvin, which is uh, about 8 times what we've done already by 2100, which doesn't sound too bad except we're doing it faster than any change. We've been that warm in the past but we're doing it faster than any change ever. And that's the worrying thing because when we did it in the past, you know, the, the dinosaurs, it was four degrees warmer then. But it got four degrees warmer over 100,000 years, so the trees just moved north. They would drop their seeds. But now we're talking about doing it in 100 years. The trees are just going to die. And in fact, I already see this in Colorado where I grew up. When I drive up the mountains, all those trees are dead already from beetle infestation because they got weaker because they're not in their proper environment anymore. It's gotten too warm. So, uh, so yeah, there you go. And I hope Ravi's wrong about the uh, runaway greenhouse because uh, that's irreparable. <laughs> There's no adapting to Venus, right? We don't get to do that. Yeah. Can I ask what the Ravi? Ravi. I missed the yeah. very first oh, sorry. Ravi is a friend of mine who's uh, he's a scientist at Penn State University, and he just published a paper that uh, moves the inner edge of the habitable zone to 0.996 AU, which means we're more on the edge of what we consider habitable than we once thought. It used to be it was much closer than that. It was like 0.92, and uh, and the general consensus was there would be no way to dump enough CO2 into our atmosphere to get into a runaway greenhouse like Venus because we just weren't close. We didn't have enough solar flux to do that. And he's saying, maybe we do. Now, that isn't something that's going to, I mean, honestly, by the time that happens, there probably won't be humans on the planet. And we, yeah, yeah, right. Well, and it, I mean, to put things into perspective, this is not the first time this has happened. I was talking to my astronomy kids about this the other day, that uh, two billion years ago, there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. Right? And then this crazy little organism developed the ability to process carbon dioxide into oxygen and, started dump and it just proliferated across the entire planet and started dumping oxygen into the atmosphere. That killed 99% of the organisms that were alive at that time because they couldn't handle it. Right? So it, it wiped out practically everything on the planet and yet here we are. I know. And it didn't even care. It didn't even have Catholicism to be guilty about it. Right? <laughs> well, so that, that, and that's an attitude, right? I mean, if, you, if all you care about is the planet Earth and you don't really care about humans per se, we're fine. Don't even worry about it. We're just another natural creature doing natural things, right? I mean, where did we come from? So, and I kind of, in the back of my head, like to hold that idea because, frankly, I'm not sure we're going to fix this. I mean, we were just, I just saw a talk the other day that, you know, we cannot fit, if we took all of the fossil fuels in the ground, that we know of and burn them in the next hundred years, we will do irreparable damage to the planet. We just can't do it. And yet everybody's like, even President Obama, who should know better, is saying we got to get the natural gas and the oil out of the ground. It's like, no, keep it in the, in the ground because we can't afford to burn it. But yet we're going to burn it anyway. So there you have it. Yeah. I have a nifty new slogan for our cause. What's that? There's NIMBY my back Yeah. Here. How about NIMBY? Not in my future timeline. <laughs> there you go. I like that. And, and, you know, to be perfectly fair, we're very adaptable creatures. We evolved during the Ice Age, which was significantly colder than it is now, and here we are. It's probably going to all be fine. But I think an awful lot of people are going to die. <laughs> but that's okay, too, because they were going to die anyway. <laughs> right? So be, be optimistic. Yeah. 
It's just, I honestly, at this point, I just don't want to be alive when the human population goes from 9 billion to 1 billion in the course of 100 years. I just don't want to see that happen. That's going to be awful. After that, it'll probably be fine. But that, that is going to be awful. I, yeah, so probably. I mean, so. Yeah. Should I buy Maybe. Yeah. Well, so Siberia, the Russians have uh, been on record as actively wanting to promote global climate change because most of Siberia is unarable. And if we do get global climate change, they're, they're, they will become the wheat belt. Of course, we'll become the Sahara. So, and you're talking wars and famine. It's not going to be pretty. But. This is why I bring this up, is that you have, to, you have to ask yourself what you care about. Do you care about the next hundred years? If yes, you should sell your car, buy solar panels, stop everything you do that burns fossil fuels if you can. If you care about the next hundred years. If you care about the next 10,000 years, pff, no, just burn it. <laughs> right? We're going to wipe out half the population on the planet. It's all good. And the people who survive will probably enjoy their lives better. Darwin, yeah. right. so it is all being recorded. Yeah. <laughs> I am going to edit this out before it goes. Yeah, but it, but it's true, and I think you have to ask. I and I, honestly, I don't care. I just want the the problem I have is, and this is a political statement, but the problem I have is that the people in charge of this country, mostly on the right, seem to think that it's okay to talk about how important our children are, but yet they don't seem to give a damn about the next 100 years. So I just want them to be honest. Be honest. You do not care about what happens to half the people on this planet for the next 200 years. Just be honest about it. And then I'm fine. Burn all the natural gas. I'll be dead before it happens. So. I just want them to be honest about it, though. They won't be honest about it. They just deny it. They say it's not happening. It's happening. Okay? It's happening. All right. So now, um, let's talk about slow rotators, because this is where it gets even more fun. Um, if you're slowly rotating, right, can you balance all of the energy everywhere? No, you can only balance it some places. And so what we do is we write down our energy balance, but we include a term. This is the area that we're, in, we're hitting with the sun. So this is the area under the sun. Okay. And uh, we multiply that by the surface temperature of the planet, which is Tp. It's just uh, Tp to the fourth. And then we set that energy balance, same as we had before, to what's coming in. Except we only care about the area uh, that's getting hit. So we've, just, we've done the exact same thing. We just replaced the area of the whole planet to just one little block on the planet, like this table is all we're talking about. I know it does, but it isn't. Your book uses this, so I didn't like it either. But this is just area. Would it help if I just did A, yeah. S? OK. It doesn't matter, because it cancels out <laughs> anyway. So we don't care. It cancels out. And if you run that through and do the same thing we did before, that just means that the subsolar temperature of the planet, or the temperature of the piece of the planet directly beneath the sun, is 395, 1 minus A, to the 1 quarter times R over 1 AU to the minus 1 half. So where does it break off from a uh, fast rotator? Mm. Where is the cutoff? So, your, so the ratio of your rotation to your orbit has there have to be many rotations per orbit. That's the way I do it. So, so in the case of the Earth, we've got 365 rotations per orbit. That's a fast rotator. In the case of Mercury, you have three rotations for every two orbits. Is that right? Yeah, or two for every three. Anyway, not very many. Um, but is it the amount of time that each portion of the on itself is? Pointing at the sun, but the same amount of the arc. No, well, no, because, well, and I guess faster. I. I mean, it's going around yeah. faster than the sun, so you would think that it would just get around. So, probably what really depends is, uh, I guess a better factor would be how fast can you dissipate the energy on the dark side? Because okay. you're heating up, cooling down, heating up, cooling down, heating up, cooling down. So, that's if so that's. If you're to right. the same, you're okay. Right. Are you pretty similar to how it's probably the No, no, it isn't. Because it, it still has a crust on it. Yeah. So, but, so what this, how do we interpret this? This is the hottest 
the temp planet can be. So if you have a slow rotator, that just means you're roasting one side. You can't really say too much about what's happening anywhere else, but you know what the maximum temperature is. And in the case of the, if the Earth was a slow rotator, if I put those same numbers in, that would put us at about, it would put us over boiling, right? So, uh, so it's a good thing. If we were rotating more slowly, we could not, we would not have a habitable planet here. And the reason I just bring all this out, and we're going to do more of this on Tuesday, is uh, next Tuesday, is that the there are so many factors that come into play to talk about habitability, right? So, for example, we found Earth-like planets around red dwarf stars, but they're most likely tidally locked to the planet, which or to the star, which means they're slow rotators. So, even though they're in the habitable zone traditionally, they're slowly rotating, which means their maximum temperature is going to be much higher. Although the other side is going to be much colder and it will depend on their atmosphere whether they can circulate it fast enough to keep the planet habitable and we just don't know. So, yeah. Okay. So uh, in, terms of, in terms of planets and their temperatures, distance from the sun matters but also what your atmosphere is made out of, how fast you're rotating, all that kind of stuff. The last thing that matters is whether or not you can hold on to an atmosphere. I've already talked about the Earth. We've got a 33 degree warming factor because we have an atmosphere. If we didn't have an atmosphere, we'd look like the moon. So the atmosphere is really important. So it raises the question, how do you hold on to an atmosphere? <laughs> that's right. Gravity. That's right. You've got two things that let you keep an atmosphere. One is gravity. The other one is how hot you are. Because if you're hot enough, we talked about this with the chromosphere, if you're hot enough, you'll lose the atmosphere. So we can again do what we do before, write down VRMS. That's the temperature of the gas, or related to the temperature of the gas, 3 kT over the mass of the particle that made out of, and the escape speed, which is equal to 2 gm over r, which is the radius of the planet, and the vrms has to be greater than 1 sixth of v escape. And that's approximate. approximate relationship, yeah. If your vrms is greater than 1 sixth of v escape, you lose your atmosphere. 